All right, easy me. I know I said if there's something I can help you with, I'll try. I just didn't think you'd ask about how to warn your fans about your next performance. I would call this being proactive, though. First, do the grown-up thing and let people know that this episode contains strong language and adult themes, so listener discretion is advised. That way, in case you slip up and need censoring, you have your butt covered. And we're gonna circle back to that. All right. Secondly, tell the fans that this performance may contain spoilers for any anime, so if they're not prepared and haven't seen shows such as Hitoriji Me My Hero, Bloom Into You, or Love Stage, they may hear about endings before they're ready. You don't want to do anything before you're ready, which reminds me that... Be... Tell you what, you and I will just circle back to that one too. And finally, get your legal jargon out there by saying that the opinions expressed are those of the individual performers and do not represent the views of Senna Productions as a whole. Don't get the whole company in trouble just because you bought that limited edition DVD of Ryoma's first live concert on the wrong credit card. Now, to prepare yourself even further, grab your favorite drink, maybe some marshmallows, a nice box of wine, and... Izumi... Izumi, are you listening to me? Stop incessantly refreshing that online auction and pay attention! You need to get on set! Happening, friends, fans, and fam. Welcome to another episode of Dub Talk, the podcast where a group of pre debut idols get together to talk about the latest and greatest in English anime dubs. I'm here tonight with my girls Stephanie and Megan, so get out your box wine. It's but- Tuesday night, and I have to go out and get my hair done tomorrow, so no wine for Megan. Come on. Uh, but, but Gigi, you're asking yourself, didn't you just have a ladies' night two days ago where you talked about Love Stage for almost two and a half hours? Aren't you done? Well, no, no, never, no, no, never. You see, loyal listener, we have a very special treat for you. Instead of a ladies' night, we have a special guest. And instead of just box wine, we've gotten out the marshmallows, the chocolate, the graham crackers. <laughs> Ready maybe, for today? Yep, maybe some Baileys and some coffee. Yes! We've got a nice little campfire going on this spring evening. It's time to bust out the sleeping bags and the camp chairs. Pick up your best stick, your toasting stick, because tonight we will be having a chat with the fun police himself, <laughs> the Jake <laughs> and our newly dubbed Rainbow Overlord, David Wall, the director and writer of Love Stage. Hello, Dub Talk listeners. Yay! It's still totally ladies' night, and I am sorry to tell you, I brought the box wine anyway. Yay! So, Extra box wine, perfect. Done. It's all happening now. <laughs> yes. yes. My own heart. God bless. God bless. I'm a little crying already. It's fine, fam. In the club. <laughs> In the club, yes. Hopefully, the glitter will fall down on me. We, we, we already talked about how, about Glitter the other night. Let's not talk about this again. Mom. So, if you, if you guys don't know who David Wald is, you must not be listening to the Dub Talk episodes that I'm in, where I cry and I scream a lot. Uh, <laughs> here's some, this amazing gentleman here has performed in over 100 anime as a voice actor and recently got into the writing and directing game. You can hear his ridiculously talented voice as the narrator in Mr. Tonegawa's Middle Management Blues. Bula in Akame Ga Kill, my personal favorite, Reiji Sakamaki from Diabolic <laughs> Lovers, and most recently, <laughs> Ray Sagara in Love Stage. As for writing and directing, he has pulled double duty for Tata Never Falls in Love, Hitori Jume My Hero, and Love Stage, along with directing the Yuri anime Bloom Into You. Now tonight, we're going to focus most of our campfire chat on these three titles and dubbing LGBTQ plus anime in general because, well... Our Rainbow Overlord is here, and we have lots of burning questions we need answers to. I am here fire, to spread right? rainbows. Set fire to your questions. Yes! <laughs> Burn, Burn it to the ground! Burn, Burn to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said all that, Gigi, because I don't know who the hell David Wald is. Every, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Gigi, my press agent. Yes, finally, my day has come. <laughs> all of those tweets have finally paid off <laughs> everything go, in my life has led up to this Gigi thanks <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so 
so much for coming here tonight and talking with us yeah, about basically you so anything much. you want to talk about. I am delighted. I've, I've been looking forward to talking to you all. I, I love your show. Thank you. <laughs> I love your show. You're all adorable. I'm glad to be here. It's going to be fun. I am such a cretin on the show, though. Box line, anyone? Yes, please. All yeah. Excellent. Perfect. There you go. Thank, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Very good. Thank very you, good. Very good. All right, we're I guess, ready. I guess my first question is, when you toast your marshmallows, do you set them on fire, or do you actually just let them kind of toast? Oh, my God. Darling, it depends on my mood. I sometimes like a little flame. I do, sometimes. What I like to do is set it on fire, and then, you know, you got to have the graham crackers and the chocolate bars ready, right? Oh, absolutely. So you set the thing on fire, and then while it's on fire, you douse it right on the bar of chocolate. You close the thing up. you got a toasty s'mores. you got a little fire in there, melted the chocolate, gave it a little char. It's a brilliant experience. I highly recommend it. I'm, I'm down with this recipe. We're going to do the cooking show next week. We'll, we'll yeah, go through we go. all this. Yay! We'll have the finished ones like in, waiting in the oven, so we don't have to for people to you know we don't have to they don't have to wait to see it created. They, they and they'll have, have been sitting in the oven for like fingers. five hours, yeah. and then we have to pretend it's still good. There we go. Great. <laughs> it's no the worry. magic of television. I can fake it real while it's fine. <laughs> well, it's like we it's this. chocolate marshmallows and graham crackers. How bad can it be? Uh, <laughs> even when it's bad, it's still pretty good. This is true. This is true. <laughs> true. <laughs> Okay. All right. We're, we're we're done with the marshmallows. We're gonna get some into some kind of deep stuff today, guys. So you've already been warned. The disclaimer was made. So uh, <laughs> so many things. We're just gonna get right down into down and dirty into it. Um. So, Mr. Wald, there have been yes. seven because I miscounted before LGBTQ anime that have been dubbed since December of 2017. Um, and that's a major increase in titles, they, and they come from both large and small licensing companies. So, why do you think the time is now for all these anime to become localized in English as opposed to previous years? You know, I, I really I think it's been inevitable for for a, for a good. I mean, we all know this. We all know it's been inevitable. It mm -hmm, really right. just takes. Um, it's sort of like have you ever heard of the paradigm of the hundredth monkey? All right, no. Edu no. education for your listeners. So in the 50s, way back in the 50s, they were doing uh, experiments. They were studying patterns of learned behavior in primates, right? So they found this race of monkey on this chain of islands uh, off the coast of Okinawa, which is itself an island. So I, does an island have a coast? I don't know. I'm not good with geography. Anyway, <laughs> so... They're studying this breed of monkey that lives on this chain of islands. And what they're doing is dropping sweet potatoes onto the island. Now, though they're not uh, indigenous to the area, so the monkeys couldn't really figure out what the sweet potatoes were until eventually they started eating them. And they were eating, you know, they were eating the whole potato. They weren't being delicate about it. No silverware, no cutlery, no napkins, nothing. Just eating the sweet potato. And eventually, after a while, and this took, this took place across the whole chain of islands, Eventually, after a while, one of the baby monkeys, a, a, a baby female, of course, uh, figures out that she can take her potato and, like, walk into the ocean a little bit and wash it off in the ocean. And then she can eat the whole thing without all the mud and the grit and the sand from it landing on the beach from being dropped by ostensibly a helicopter or a plane. So... <laughs> She figures this out, and all her little friends around start figuring out, just on this one island on the chain. And, of course, there's no the – the, the, the spread of monkey was not traveling between the islands, so they weren't, like, hanging out for big parties on the weekends or anything. Like, each island was its own little colony. Same breed, different colonies. So one young monkey figures it out. A couple of her friends start figuring out. And then slowly, over a period of months, maybe years, it starts to leak up to the adult community. And when the hundredth monkey on this single island began washing off its potato, suddenly, within days, the entire species of monkey across the whole chain of islands started washing off their potato. Now, it's easy to imagine with a study like that that, you know, we can extrapolate that monkeys have some crazy psychic Jean Grey bond, like, and they can talk to each other in their heads, and they're like, hey, washing potatoes, good, tell your friends, you know. But no, probably <laughs> not. Um... What it was was sort of an inevitability, and that wave came when it was time to come. And that one little monkey just happened to be the first one to catch it. You know what I mean? So it's sort of, um, 
you know, the prevalence of gay dubbed anime, I think, was was just a simple inevitability. And for a lot of, you know, this stuff has been around for a long time. And for a lot of years, um, in adaptation, we've avoided those titles, largely, because I think because they felt that it was too fringe a group to appeal to, you know, when, when you could, you know, you could spend your production costs on this, you know, this uh, action show that like all everybody's going to freak out about or this little title of about boys kissing boys. Like I know which one I prefer to watch, but by and large, most people want to see the action shows and the fighting and the power streams and, you know, all the stuff. Right. So <clears throat> if you have a limited budget to produce and we usually do, you know, um, then you're going to select the titles that you think have the most commercial uh, potential, you know, the most profit potential. That's how you keep a business alive. So I think for the most part, they were avoiding these titles because, you know, they, they, uh, uh, they just felt it was too narrow a group to, to go after. M my whole position, you know, the, the, the way that I got uh, Sentai to Greenlight Love Stage was, I mean, it was a, a long list of points I illustrated to get there, but one of my main arguments is the fact that I, I would, I would, I would, I would say somewhere around maybe one percent, maybe not even one percent of the English-speaking population uh, in the world, or we'll just talk about America since that's where we are, um, consumes anime on a regular basis. Less than one percent. Meanwhile, somewhere around maybe twenty percent of the English-speaking population uh, uh, ascribes to one color or another on the rainbow flag. So what I was, the, you know, the bell I was ringing was that we can find this material because there's horrible stuff in there, you know, horrible stereotype, tropey, yeah. you know, ridiculousness. <laughs> and but I've it, watched them all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But scattered throughout that field are a, a lot of little gems, you know. And my, my point has been if we can find those and feature those and adapt them, dub them, um, give them an authentic voice, give a, a, the queer population an authentic view of itself, at least a version, an archetype, you know, of itself, then we can appeal to a demographic which vastly outnumbers our current existing demographic, or, you know, our existing target audience. So, I mean, even if a small portion of that 20% of the population who may never have heard of anime ever sees that this is a medium that's trying to sing them a song of themselves in, a, in any medium anywhere, then they're going to appreciate that. I know my brothers and sisters, they'll appreciate that and they will go to it and they'll support it because it's supporting them. You know, that has been my argument all along. Took a lot of years for it to land. Um, so this isn't, it's not like it just like happened, you know, uh, um, this is certainly something I've been talking about for a long time. It's something I think I know, um, Marissa Lenti at Kuma Holdings. They're the ones who did the, this boy is a professional wizard. This boy suffers from crystallization. Those, this boy titles, which were gorgeous. Um, I know she's been interested in, in doing it for a really long time. Like, I mean, like you, she's a dedicated Yowie fan. Yep. Um, among many other things. So it's it's something that's been talked about. Um, as to why 2017 suddenly, um, you know, just maybe because the, the, the planets fell into alignment. You know, we had some good titles come over from Japan. Um, uh, and it, I think it may have spurred some in the industry to take a second look at the, at the, at the representational material they had in their in their back catalog, and thank God, you know. Yeah, I am very grateful for this because one of the points that I make a lot is that everybody needs to have their story told, yeah. and I know personally, like I have a lot of friends who are gay, who are lesbian, and like if they had just had these growing up, like maybe they wouldn't have felt like so much pain, and like they would have been able to. Yeah just know that it's okay to be themselves yeah. as opposed to having 
stuff, you know, thrown against them every other day. I so that's can absolutely relate to that. I mean, I I grew up in Texas in the 70s and 80s, like under Reaganomics at the height of the Oof. AIDS crisis. It was <laughs> yeah. an ugly yeah, yeah. time to be a gay kid, like to be coming of age as a as a gay person and like. In that time and place, there was no place to look for examples. There were no positive role models. Anyone who could have been a positive role model was so uh, vilified and so decried. And, you know, and it was like you can't, you couldn't look up to them for fear someone might catch you looking up to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was, uh, uh, there was nowhere to go. And, I, you know, particularly when you look at media, in in media, whenever you have a gay person in media, I mean, this was true from the first time a gay person appeared in any film or television show or novel even uh, for quite a long time. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of mediums, particularly in a lot of American mediums, it is still absolutely true. This doesn't come from any scientific study I found. It's my own observation that you have, we essentially have three archetypes for lgbtq plus characters in our in our in, in our major mediums you've got the gay clown who's either the wildly flamboyant sort mm -hmm. of comic relief yep. um uh or i that also sort of encompasses the the sort of soft natured upstairs neighbor who usually like shows up stroking a cat and dispensing <laughs> sage wisdom, you know, and also <laughs> makeup tips, right? So like, uh, that's like, the like, the be like the best friend kind of in a way too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. My best gay friend who yes. gives the audience their narrative view, you know, it's just a, a vehicle. So that's one. And that's like probably 95% of everything forever. Um, you've also got uh, something that's become very popular now, which has some merit, um, except that I would like to see us move past it, and that is the gay martyr. So you have characters in shows, uh, particularly on American television. This happens all the time. You know, they'll, they, they any any show that has a gay character generally turns them into a martyr, and that character's job is to suffer for being gay. So, um, you know, think of a show. It's one of the superhero shows on TV now. Uh, oh. In an earlier season, they gave us uh, a police captain who was gay. And when the police captain revealed that to the to the lead of the show and also to the audience, it was I was like, wow, what? Because he was super like butch and swarthy and like a cop, you know, like a TV cop. He was every bit of TV cop. And I was like, wow, gay. Interesting choice. I'm so with you. Well, they develop that character a little bit um, until his narrative arc uh, largely ended at some point when he got injured in the line of duty and his husband or boyfriend, I forget, I think it was his husband, couldn't get into the emergency room to see him because they were husbands and not husband and wife. Like, and that was basically the end of his arc, right? Wow. So you've got characters who, you know, they're revealed to the audience as gay and then suddenly... All they contribute to the narrative from that point forward is their gay angst and suffering, right? Mm -hmm. So huh. that's archetype two. Archetype three is the gay psychopath, which is, uh, right. you know, you have villains. It's generally villains. And at some point or another, it'll be revealed that this villain also happens to be gay. Uh, you know, we've seen it in films. We've seen it in TV. We've seen it everywhere. Um and these characters essentially, it's like I think the laziest thing a writer can do is to add gay to a villainous character because they might think, oh, but maybe that's like part of why he's broken because of gay angst, making him then the gay martyr and the gay psychopath. Or maybe he's a really clownish gay psycho, uh, thereby making him the clown and the psychopath. Or maybe he's just gonna be a gay villain because it helps us illustrate how sick he is you know what i mean it's just such yeah, an insidious yeah. and lazy choice and unfortunately that's virtually everything we have i mean uh in western media uh, you know of course there are many depictions that are better than others and of course there are exceptions to the rule but 
by and large, those are the three archetypes we get. And we really need to move past that. And I feel strongly that anime has a lot more than that to offer. It's got all those two. Um, but it does have a lot more than that to offer. I mean, we've all seen the shows where yeah. <laughs> people are clownishly ridiculous or right. you know, not a lot of, not a lot of gay martyrs um, in anime because anime has a funny thing about not wanting to use the word gay. Yeah. They kind of dance around it. Yeah. Lot. It's sort of like yep. they put it in a world where, Oh boys, there's kiss boys sometimes and it's fine. Or, in this show, every girl loves a girl. You know, it's like a, it's like, like they change the universe a little bit, or which like, is one of the reasons. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, no, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just saying, Not at all. like, it's a show where there's uh, predominantly more of one gender than the other, so there's a lot of meaningful relationships built between characters of the same gender, but they're never going to outright say that, like, yeah, they're in I, love with each other. Right, right, right. And that's something anime plays a lot too: is the gay inference particularly for the girls over in Japan who are like the huge, you know, yaoi acolytes who yes. just love no that. Yeah, who just <laughs> love that, you know, and God love them, you know, thank <laughs> God. But, uh, uh, um, yeah, so there's a lot of that just to sort of appeal. It's sort of like girl fan service, you know what I mean? So... You know, that's what it gets used for over there. But every once in a while, you get a tale like Ichirijime, My Hero, where these characters are struggling with it. Like, they're looking it right in the face and they're struggling with it. Or in Love Stage, where I think more so than most other sort of uh, uh, rom-com style anime, I think Love Stage takes a very responsible look at, you know, what, what that coming of age might be like for someone who's struggling with the identity. You know, uh, and those 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 things are out there. Those little gems are out there. And I and it's you know, my effort is to find and feature those. And yet at the same time, I I do think there's a place for the other stories. You know, I remember I did a show as many years ago called Dramatical Murder. Oh, oh I'm, I'm the one who is yeah. very familiar yeah, 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 with yeah, yeah, yeah. that. Familiar you all know this. Oh. Right? Yeah. So I was the yeah. So I was the the one who has most experience with yes, that franchise. Very good. Very good. Seen, seen it uh, 78 times then? Oh no, I um, played the game. Yes, okay, all right, so very good, yes. <laughs> all right, so I was uh, uh, the robot doggy, right? <laughs> yes. And, uh, the, best, the best dog. Yeah, and when, <laughs> you know, we recorded that and the director, it was Chris Ayers, um, had told me there was some there was some gay material in it. Like there were characters, there were inferences, there were crushes, there were whatnot. Um, that was all the briefing I got. And I was like, great. I'm glad. I'm so glad that that's getting it. Up. Um, then we got to the OVA, oh God. <laughs> which is basically just like, well, like a half hour prison rape fantasy. Like every character in the show takes turns prison oh, raping oh, oh God. the main character. Oh, and good. yeah. And when I got to that, I was like, okay, this is a really unfortunate turn. We could have taken yeah. this somewhere very fun and cool, but instead, it's the old, you know, if you're if you're if you're gay and you're questioning, it has to be forced on you to come to for you to come through it. You know what I mean? It's really weird because that OVA is explicitly all of the bad endings. That's all the right. bad endings. All the good endings are there. Some of them are actually genuinely very sweet. Yeah. See, uh, you know, again, just a just a choice, and maybe that was to appeal to the. To the darker side of the of the I, I, army. As somebody who's you know? played the games, I explicitly went out of my way to avoid every bad ending because I knew mm -hmm. all of them, and I was like, "This sucks. Get me back to the good, yeah. like the nice, the nice crap." Yeah, yeah. Well, that that speaks entirely of you. Um, uh, yeah. So, like, there was that, and for a long time, like, I was never like, I was never ashamed of having been in that show. It was, it was never anything like that. But I, I often sort of carried around a little guilt about that show that it had come to that ending and that I had helped release that on the world. And maybe, you know, some gay kid like I was back in the day might see that and just have another reason to think that gay is bad, you know, and that made me feel bad about it. But, um, I met a kid at a convention, I believe it was at, it might have been in Portland at Kumori Con, or maybe it was Con All Delete. Unfortunately, I can't remember. 
but he was cosplaying the blue haired kid Alba. Is that yeah. his name? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he was cosplaying Alba, and he attended um, uh, an LGBTQ panel that I did. Um, seemed to me clearly to be a kid who was struggling with this or had struggled with this. And, you know, we talked a little bit about dramatical murder. Of course, he was very interested in discussing it. And I told him, like, that I, how I felt about it, that I'm, you know, that I'm glad it was out there. I just wish it had had a, I just wish it had, that OVA had been something different. Um, but even despite that OVA, Alba was a character that that kid really connected with. Mm -hmm. And in that moment of talking with him about it, I realized that, you know, we find ourselves in, in strange places. You know, we, 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 uh, we relate to characters sometimes for very strange, uh, you know, unusual, unanticipated reasons. And for whatever reason that it felt like Alba as a character helped him navigate some stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I honor that. And, and you know, and I, I, I have a sort of, of jokey summation of that by saying, and this is absolutely true, that I know, like, perfectly reasonable, highly educated, progressive thinking women who stood in line to see Fifty Shades of Grey, which I didn't see. I don't know what it is. But it didn't look to me like it was a, <laughs> much about, like, elevating the feminine. You know what I mean? Like, it's just it, cackling it in the background. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, have, so, I, yeah. Haven't, I haven't seen it either, so we're good. I, I avoided it. <laughs> I avoided it. it, it, it was yeah. pretty Listen, sad. I mean, I get... <laughs> I get, I get, I got all kinds of appreciation for some some, some quality trash viewing. I'm all in. Right? <laughs> yeah. I just, I haven't made it to Fifty Shades yet. But uh. like, that's my point: is that even though in a world where where women are still struggling to be to feel equal to men, you know, still uh, having crises, um, you know, particularly now in the Me Too movement, women are like have a are fighting now in a way that they've never really fought before for consideration. You know what I mean? And it seems to me that, I mean, probably if 50 shades came out today, it might not get so great a, a response, you know, considering the, the way the tides have turned in the, in the uh, modern discussion of these, of these issues, issues of, of uh, women's rights and women's equality. But um, still there was something in that film that, any number of women could relate to. And so that's why, even though you've got a show like Junjo Romantica, which in my mind, you know, it was, it, when I went on my early, I went on sort of an early, uh, uh, you know, like a, a, a big trip watching all the yaoi that I could find because I was looking for the right title. Eventually I found Love Stage. Um, so I watched a lot of Junjo and I watched uh, other shows whose names I can't remember because I just kept seeing like the older man forcing himself on the younger man until like the second to last or last episode where, the, you know, the young man finally gives in, you know, and uh, I didn't like that trope. I didn't like the idea of, of someone forcing themselves on someone. It just, you know, and it's, that doesn't even necessarily describe rape. In this case, they they didn't all go there, but it's uh, extremely forceful and aggressive. Of course, the thing you have to consider is that in Japanese storytelling, and in fact, as far as I've observed, I could be wrong, but as far as I've, I've observed in Japanese culture, the aggressive and assertive and dominant male is still a widely celebrated archetype, right? Yeah, yeah it's still a thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, certainly okay. in the storytelling, if not in the if not in the city streets, at least in the storytelling, it's still very much a thing, and and that stuff is revered the same way we used to revere like Bogart and Bacall movies. You know, it was a different time. But how many times have you seen like he kisses her, she slaps him for kissing her, then she grabs him and kisses him? That's yep. a physical assault and two sexual assaults by yeah. today's standards, right? Yes. But it ended in a beautiful romance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, storytelling has the freedom to do that. And the other thing I think that I eventually ar arrived at, and it took me a while, was that I had to understand that these relationships, as they're depicted in Yao in uh, in Yaoi and anime, they're metaphor. 
you know, they're metaphors, which is why I think, for example, as we all know, because I'm certain everybody who's listening to the show has completely binged Love Stage by now, probably twice. I hope. If, if you haven't, um, then what is wrong with you? Exactly. <laughs> Go why are you Press pause this? and watch it now. Come back yes. later. It's um, not that hard to watch. A sh- it's like not a hard show to watch at all. Like yeah. four hours, maybe. maybe. But you've got in Love Stage, you've got a situation where Rioma nearly forces himself on easily. It's a pretty rough thing. I'm talking about F3, of course, as I'm sure you all know. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's a thing. but And I had all kinds of trouble with it. You know, the reason I still felt Love Stage was the best candidate, sort of the flagship entry in this idea of getting LGBTQ plus anime out there. And, uh, and I'll tell you, from my end, Love Stage was the one I went to Sentai with and said, you guys already have this. This is what we have to do. Laid out my whole plan for them. And it was after we got, I got a group being led on Love Stage that both Theta Regime and then Bloom Into You came along. Oh. So, so Love Stage was the big first pitch. And as a result of that, that's why Theta Regime got a dub. Because they're like, well... If we're going to do Love Stage, we ought to do this one. It's it's a little newer. It's a little you know. It's a little hotter. It's a, of, of higher interest right now because it's new. And when they pitched Teacher Resume to me the first time, I watched it and I went back to them. I said, "You guys do not want to dub this," because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, what I was looking for was the flagship to send out to my gay brothers and sisters who don't know anything about anime. And I figured at the time to dub Hita Rijime and put it next to or near love stage in that category was going to be to say, hello, brothers and sisters of the Rainbow Tribe. I am here to sing you a song of yourselves. Here's a story about a teacher who falls in love with his student. Never mind. Moving on. So like, that is yeah. like, the, that's like a thing that happens in like straight anime too. And I'm just sitting there like, uh-uh. Oh, yeah. Not, oh, I mean, it's nope, not today, Satan. Everywhere. Not today, yeah. Satan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, I mean, certainly to be clear, this is not unique to Yaoi or Yuri, of course. No. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, uh, the situation in Love Stage, you know, the, the assault in Love Stage, to me, the fact that they spend the rest of the show looking at that right in the face. I mean, Ryoma yeah. spends the rest of the show apologizing. He spends the rest of the show trying to make himself a better man. And that, to me, was laudable and very much a story worth telling. But even since then, I've arrived at the conclusion that what that assault is, is metaphor. It's, it's, it's an easy metaphor. You know, it's something we've spotted in a lot of anime where the assertive male sort of throws himself at the, at the submissive male or the woman. Uh, and sometimes the other way around, um, uh, uh, until they relent. And it's like, it's a near assault and it's very, very uncomfortable for us to view. It has been for a while, uh, here in America, but now more so than ever. But what that is in particularly, I think in Rioma's case in love stage is a metaphor for how bad things can get for you. If you've spent as Rioma has 20 years either suppressing or completely unaware, more likely suppressing his attraction to men. You know, when you grow up suppressing your feelings or having your feelings suppressed by someone else, uh, it can take you to some really dark places, particularly if you have no examples to look at, if you have no one helping you through those doors or even showing you where they are. So something, you know, the assault that I think Ryoma delivers on Izumi is, is really just sort of an allegory of the, the desperate places we can get when we hide from ourselves, you know? Would you also say that a little bit of the reason why Ryoma does that too is, if I'm correct in his backstory, he also says that, like, male producers would try to take advantage of him and would put oh, his yeah. hands on him. That is a, that character, you see that, I've, I've forgotten the character's name, it's terrible of me, but uh, I didn't have to cast it, so I forgot his name, but uh, <laughs> he makes an appearance, it was a producer, and you see it in the flashback, it's the, when Ryoma's saying that during their walk in the park in yeah. episode four, yeah. like, they, you see this sort of green, shaggy-haired producer putting his hand on little 
little little boy Rioma's ass, right? And then at the end of the show, it might be in the OVA, which you all won't have seen yet. Um, we see him again, and he just sort of sees a big poster of Izumi, like a big uh, marquee with Izumi's face on it, and he gives this kind of creepy sort of smile, yep. and then walks away, right? So. Yes. Um, yeah, Rioma certainly went through that. And certainly if we believe anything about the stories we've heard about how things go in Hollywood for young men, um, you know, this isn't new to us either. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if you take it in a literal sense, I think there are a lot of ways to interpret how Rioma could have gotten to that place and behaved that way. Um, and I think that same literal sense informs that his behavior after that incident, you know, the, the guilt he felt over it and his immediate desire to do everything he could to make things right really speaks highly. I mean, that's a character who's in recovery. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that works in the, in the literal, in the abstract as a metaphor, you know, it, it, it works because again, that that's, you get to a very desperate place when you suppress yourself in any sense, the thing you suppress will always be the thing that breaks through at the least possible convenient time for you. You know, if you've lived 10 years of life, you know, this, you know what I mean? So, you know, I think as a metaphor, it works because it, it, it's sort of illustrative of, of how, how deep and dark and horrible things can get when you, when you know you're gay, but you can't, you feel you can't tell anybody. You can't let anybody know. And imagine if you're also a celebrity. You know, celebrities can't really come out in in America so much yet. We've got a few who've done so quite bravely, but generally, if you're a film star in America, uh, particularly if you've already been working and you come out, you've played your last straight role. You know. <laughs> Meanwhile, a gay a gay role will come along. They'll cast a straight actor. And that straight actor will win an Academy Award. Oh, he played gay. He's so brave. You know? Yeah, here's true. here's your Oscar, Oscar. <laughs> I was thinking of a different Oscar entirely. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So I think that that event in Love Stage and the way that those characters handle it is... Um, as a metaphor, I think it works best. Because then you get, you you know, otherwise you just get mired. Like, shouldn't someone have called the police? Uh, shouldn't there be some sort of investigation? Shouldn't he be having to go to door to door from now on and tell people he's a predator or whatever? Like, but that doesn't serve the story. And this story is about someone who came on real strong and then figured out that wasn't going to work. And so made himself a better man to win the heart of his love. I mean, like, doesn't get any better than that in a love story, you know? What was the original question? <laughs> I, don't I don't remember, but that was more than worth it. Good, um, okay, great. Woohoo! Next, okay. what All is right. your favorite color? <laughs> Purple. <laughs> Just pink. <laughs> Girls All after right. my own heart. Let's, mm. let's talk about something a little more lighthearted, sort of. So let's, let's circle back to Love Stage, because there's something on our minds that we just discovered when we were recording this episode <gasps> that we have to ask you about. Oh, I know where this is going, too. Okay. Uh-oh. There's a blonde guy who is the head of B-Dash Records, who yes. is played by James Belcher. Yes. What kind yes. of accent does he have? <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's an approximation of a sort of South London Cockney sort of situation, a la like, you know, your Jason Statham. Okay, I can your, now you say Cockney, yeah. I can hear it. Okay, I can hear. It. Yeah, but here's yeah. the thing: I completely invented this about like that character's name is uh, Ryuzaki Kojiro, yes. is the president yes. of B Dash Entertainment, and. Uh, with no permission from anyone, I created a brand new backstory for him. You don't get any of it in the story, but here's what happened to Ryuzaki. Oh Not my God. canon, oh God. except go, that yes. it's in the show, so now it's canon. So, uh, so Ryuzaki grew up, he's a Japanese kid. The hair is, is bleached. Um, he's much older than he looks. He got swept up. He went to London for like school, right? He got swept up in the whole punk 
punk phase, started playing bass in a punk band that never worked out. But he was really smart. Meanwhile, he completely adopted all of the Brit pop punk like affectations, the accent, the outfits, everything. And then he went back to Japan because he was tired of being a punk player. So he starts his own agency to make some real money, uses his street smart London learned, you know, tough kid act to be an amazing manager. And all of this just came from one simple fact, one simple fact, which was that, and of course, He's lived his whole life and he's absolutely kept the accent, but it's totally a choice. Um, this came from two sources for me. One was that I saw an interview with uh, John Lydon, who is, uh, for those of you who don't know, he's Johnny Rotten from uh, from the punk band. Uh, Sex Pistols. Oh, God. Right? Yes, Sex yeah. Pistols. Thank you. Johnny Rotten, singer from the Sex Pistols. And so, like, you don't get any more London punk than that. And I saw an interview with him. He's at this point maybe 60 and just every bit as full of piss and vinegar as he ever was. And I thought, <laughs> that is Ryuzaki. So that was my goal. And the other thing was, long ago, I worked in a bookshop. And that bookshop hired a girl who had grown up in Indiana, which is where I was. And she had just gone to Ireland on some sort of sabbatical or exchange thing. She was there, I think, a little over a year. And when she came back, she was talking like this all the time. Oh, I got really drunk in oh, the car last okay. night. Oh, and I'm like, honey, you grew up here. You were there less than a year. What are you doing? But here's the thing. This was like, when I met her, was like a full two years after she'd already come back. So she had clearly made the choice to adopt and absolutely keep that accent because it made her seem exotic. And that's exactly what Ryuzaki Kojiro did. Thank you for attending my TED Talk. See, I was sort of right, guys. I was sort I of right. I thought Australian. We did too. We really <laughs> thought it was Australian. Like, I've, I've seen, I've lived, I've, I've been to a wedding with a full of Australians. I know what this sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, yeah, I was no, like, it's... maybe he's keeping it to be a poser because he knows. But Absolutely. He was not really sure, but he could still make this British slash Australian accent happen, and no one is the wiser. I was yeah. right. I feel validated in my speech <laughs> now. I'm a GG. I'll tell you, man. I was, while writing Ryuzaki, I had to do a lot of diving into Cockney rhyming slang, and I've never had so much fun with language in my life. I would, I could like take, I could, I could go back to college and major in Cockney rhyming slang. It would be a delight. It's fabulous. Oh my god, if there was a major that would have existed for that specifically, I would totally do it. Yes, amen. Oh my god. Yes, that's what I would do with immortality. I'd just get all the degrees ever. Oh, there you go. <laughs> You'd be a doctor I'd be the world's everything. most boring Highlander. <laughs> there can be only one, but wait, first I have to get my MD. I gotta get my Dr. MD in Highlander. Highlander. Dr. Highlander. Doctor, 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 doctor. Highlander. <laughs> Esquire. <laughs> oh, God. I love Perfect. it. Perfect. I love it. I love yeah, it. So, so Ryuzaki is the total machination. And uh, uh, I'm I'm delighted with it. I love it. Especially because I got to put like brown bread in there and have a butcher's. This is Cottony Rhyming saying classics. <laughs> oh. <my God. laughs> Oh. I love him. And James just killed it. And of course, the accent's not perfect because Ryuzaki's oh. accent is not perfect, right? It's an affectation. So, like, he just went over to London for, like, the, the, the punk scene and completely lost his identity. <laughs> there it is. I wish I would have known you this. Oh, you can read all about it. Like, now that we're talking about it more, it makes, now that we're talking about it more, it makes so much more sense now. Like, the direction we're, it went, I'm like, oh, okay. We were yeah. very confused. <laughs> one of us was a little harsh. <laughs> I, I was very confused. Um, well, let's keep talking about casting for a while because I have another thing I'd like to bring up. Um, so, was it a happy accident that you casted Monica Rial as both Lala Lulu and Izumi's mom, See, or did you do that on purpose? 
No, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of double casting, a lot of swing casting is another word for it, I think, uh, in Love Stage. And I absolutely did that on purpose because Thank to you. me, okay. Love Thank Stage you. is, yes, Love Stage is to me a fairy tale. It's sort of like the gay anime Princess Bride, right? And oh my god, fun storming the castle, <laughs> yeah, yeah, except yes. we got Billy Crystal, unfortunately. We got James Bell. Lala Lulu, um, Lala Lulu is the Billy Crystal in yeah, this. Oh, there you go, yes, yes, yes. Actually, I think it would be Sabbath's Biscuit, that would be, <laughs> there that would we be go. Billy Crystal in this one. Oh, um, god, the Twinkle yeah. line destroyed uh, me, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had fun with that one, um, yes. So, this the the swing casting was very purposeful and uh. It was, I tried to be strategic about it, but you hear it all over. I mean, uh, you got Monica playing Lala Lulu and Nagisa. You've got Brittany Karbowski playing uh, Shino and also Gaga Ruru. You've got Tia Ballard playing Sato and Young Izumi and Shanti, Lala Lulu's sidekick. And of course, Chris Sabat as Biscuit, who is also by day a drag queen hairdresser, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but that was yeah, that was uh, that was very purposeful, and for me, it's predicated on the idea of like, you know, how in stage versions of Peter Pan, I don't know how many of you saw those while yeah, you were in high school. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, you have the guy who plays the father also plays, plays Hook. Captain Hook. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So the idea for the for the swing casting really for, that was my impetus. That was kind of where it came from for me. Yeah, we were we were talking about it, and I was like, you know, Izumi has to let go of Lala Lulu. I feel like I feel in my heart that Lala Lulu is almost kind of like a mother figure to him. Like, there's a lot of things absolutely that, that I feel absolutely. about these characters. I feel so much. Um, but yeah, I thought that was genius. That made my casting because you know I love Lala Lulu. Thank you. Love her. Love her. Yeah, Lala Lulu is my girl. Yeah. She is my, um, if I were going to have a girl, it would be Lala Lulu. Lala Lulu is my girl. There you go. Lala Lulu is my homegirl. But right now, she's my, she's one of my straight magical da daughters that I don't fully understand, but I admire <laughs> her. Perfect. Gaga um, Ruru is the one I go out with on the weekends, though. There you, there you she, go. She's She'd be queen. fun, right? A little danger. There we go. I just, I remember <laughs> when I was watching yesterday, I was texting them as I go, and I, I think I got to like, uh, where Izumi is like, I give up on hope. And he's like, the dark Izumi. And Gigi's just like, I love dark Izumi. I want to go out with him. <laughs> I mean, yeah, obviously, he's the boy we all want, right? Stay on we the all, dark side, Izumi. Like, we Don't all go dark. to the light. <laughs> With the vampire teeth and better eyeliner than I have. Yeah. <laughs> and the face tattoo. And like the little face, the face tat tattoo. Yeah. Oh my god, yes. Yeah. Oh. Stay with Gaga Ruru. Listen to some magical death metal. And, you know, like, uh, do something about that wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. That'd be a fun show. Maybe a season two. Okay. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in for the well, spin-off. Well, well. But I'll say the spinoff in an alternate universe. There it is. No, right. there's there is a spinoff to Love Stage that needs that an anime. Thanks. L Love yeah. Stage Ultimates. Yes, would be perfect. <laughs> and and how is it for you playing Ray, our our big gay dad, everyone's big gay dad? <laughs> that I I I had to do that. I had I know. to do that. Um, Ray is basically me, just like with way better hair. Um, <laughs> And like I, I felt really strongly. I mean, there were there was another reason, frankly, and that was because, as all of you know, since you've gotten the little hints from the show now, Ray and Shogo are indeed spoiler a couple, right? Right. <laughs> so yeah. that last um, episode did not leave anything to the imagination. <laughs> yeah, no, there are um, there are other couples in that show you don't know about unless you've read the manga. Ryuzaki and his big, tall, dark, drink of water side man Tenma. Yeah. I had a, a suspicion I of that. I did not know that one. Yeah. I had a They're suspicion. A See, I didn't catch it the first time when I watched this show like five years ago. But when we were watching it when we did the episode, I was like, I have a suspicion of these two. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like the show doesn't really give it to us, and I it would have been too. You know, I think it would have been too broad a, a, right. a, a stroke to try to, like, shove it in there somewhere. But the the one taste of it I tried to da to dangle was, like, when Ryuzaki was standing on the desk and Tenma's like, 
oh my god, we just had it polished. I wanted to sort of fight like a married <laughs> couple. But uh, yeah, that's all you get of that. Like, but they're a thing um, in the manga. Uh, spoiler. Uh, also, of course, uh, uh, Miyabi, uh, Saotome, and and uh, Kuroi Takahiro are a thing. Really? Um, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah, remember yeah. this. I'm gonna have to read yeah. the manga. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's sort of. The, the, the Takahiro Miyabi relationship is a little bit more like if Love Stage were like a regular yaoi and it followed every typical yaoi yeah. trope, okay, it would okay. follow the story of Miyabi and Takahiro. <laughs> Probably. I think Miyabi is a little nicer than like the usual sullen, dark eyed, chain smoking, you know, uh, uh, semi, you know, like. Uh, uh, but uh, that's, um, I think, a more traditional yaoi relationship, I think, those two. But, uh, yeah, that's a thing. So, like, there, there's, every, every, there's gay everywhere in Love Stage. And just sometimes you got to look for it. <laughs> well, what was the question? I already forgot. <laughs> um, Ray. About playing Ray. 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 Oh, Ray, yes. <laughs> so, uh, Ray and Shogo being, like, the sort of main secondary couple. And, of course, uh, Izumi and Ryoma being the primary couple, I definitely felt strongly that I wanted gay actors involved. Now, it's a balancing act. I, I, I didn't want to just cast all the gay roles with gay actors if they weren't also perfect for the role. You know what right. I mean? Um, and the first time I ever heard Ryoma, I mean, like in the first 30 seconds of Ryoma's appearance in episode one, the first time I ever watched it, I knew immediately that was going to be Adam Gibbs. I always knew that. There was never a question. Likewise, I always knew that Greg Ayers was going to be easy, as did the whole, whole world. Like, yeah, who yeah, else is going to play yeah, that role? <laughs> right? I mean, that's like, that's like, Greg's like an Olympic gold medalist in roles like easy to me. You know what I mean? So, like, you don't, you don't argue with that. No, so, not in the slightest. Yeah, I mean, happily. I had a gay actor to play Izumi, and I had a straight actor to play Ryoma. I wanted a straight actor as Shogo, and I wanted a gay actor as Rei. And in very, with very little thinking, I thought, well, I'm a gay actor. I'm a man. <laughs> I'll be Rei. You know? It took other people to tell me, yeah, well, that's because he's you, Dave. <laughs> so it's like okay. the sudden realization slowly realizes, like, wait, this is me, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> this is yes, my life I've now. I've chosen as my architect. Like, obviously, I'm a Slytherin, I guess. I don't know, whatever. Don't know. Welcome welcome to the team. Yeah, <laughs> hey, hallelujah. Um, we will beat But yeah, door. so I had to play Ray, and I wanted a gay actor in it anyway. And um, uh, I was glad that that happened. You know, and the, the, imp the, the idea there was if in the combination of Greg and Adam, I have a gay actor as easy me, and a straight actor playing Ryoma, that makes really good sense to me because Ryoma has a very remarkably easy time accepting his feelings. I mean, he spends a couple of episodes sort of agonizing about it, but then he runs head first over yeah. and over, straight for it, like with no qualms, which I think is extraordinary because this kid is a huge celebrity. I mean, he's like Leonardo DiCaprio around Titanic level celebrity. So big deal. Of course, he didn't do a press conference and announce that he's in love with a boy. Not yet. Maybe in another season. But, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. So real has very little struggle, and Izumi, on the other hand, has a real struggle with it. Coming to terms with himself, right? Not knowing how to feel about not knowing how to feel about how he feels. You know. And he really only finally like comes to that decision like basically in the very last episode. Well, of course, that's well, the show's this, gonna end. This you know? is how this, this works. Gonna be the end of the show. Well, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Um, my favorite part about yeah. Izumi. So, oh, I'm sorry, you were saying. Oh no, I think one of my favorite moments about like Izumi realizing he has a crush is when he starts buying all the stuff off Amazon. Yep. It's like I don't know how this all got here, Ray. And Ray's like, Yeah, I do. Don't even yeah, right. try it with me. Like, don't even try. Right. Don't even try this. Don't even lie. Yeah. You're yeah. lying yeah. to yourself. <laughs> What Ray wanted to say was, I did the same, same. thing. <laughs> In fact, I Ray's still have. Like, He's got like a shrine going in the room. <laughs> Look, I have a life-size blow-up Realma doll. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Actually, the backstory of, of Ray of is oh that 
Yeah, right. The backstory of Ray is that when he was found on the streets by Seiya Senna, he fell in love with Seiya Senna. Oh, and that's oh. why he stayed in that house, and that's why he served that family the way he did, because long ago, he was deeply in love with Seiya Senna. That love, of course, was unrequited. Um, you that know, there was a wife makes sense. involved. I can kind of see yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, and then I'm sure Shogo came after him like a bull. So, <laughs> like, you know. That's, you know, and then he, he sort of fell in with Shogo and then developed a sort of resentful but very loving relationship with him. <laughs> Shogo's a lot. Shogo <laughs> is so Shogo much. is a amalgamation of I don't know what. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't know what he is anymore. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, at the same time, you know, you look at the re relationship between Izumi and Ray and Shogo. And Izumi even says so. There's a bit in the show where they're in a that you sh you see like security tape from inside a limo, and he's talking about yeah. how scary Ray oh is, and he's God, also like yeah. a mom. Well, if you look at the relationship, I mean, Seiya and Nagisa were busy. They were actors. Yep. They were gone all the yeah. time. Yep, so the absolutely. people who raised Izumi were Ray and Shogo, mm -hmm. and Shogo is very much Ray's or, or Izumi's surrogate father, and Ray is 100% Izumi's surrogate mother. Yeah, Shogo's like the doting dad in a sense. Yes, exactly, exactly. Shogo spoils him, but they both do, so. Mm -hmm. But it's friggin' adorable. It is. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, if I if I was, like, looking down at Baby Izumi, it's like, yeah, I'd buy you all the cake you want to, kid. Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> it's like, I can't say no to that face. Friggin' magical, those That's eyes. Smiles. My lord. Cake and body pillows for everyone. Oh my god. These <laughs> artists don't know how they manipulate us. I think they know how they manipulate it. They know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, I can say that because I'm a huge Token Rambu fan and that it's absorbed my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I have 60 Stop sons. Stop drawing my soul! Stop drawing my 60 plus sons. I'm yeah. running out of money in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, God. So, I mean, just wait till they all go to college. Oh, my God. Oh. You're going to be screwed. Screwed! Uh, empty nest syndrome, let's go. Goose school is going to screw me because that's where all the kids are. Jesus yeah. Christ, where all the little kids are. <laughs> already. Oh, your sword sons, your sword son. <laughs> I'm bringing so, it down. Yes, I had to play Ray. There was no oh, choice. Thank you. I had no choice in the matter. Thank you for that. <laughs> we we all appreciate answer. it greatly. Yes. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate oh, sorry. that. <laughs> I was going to uh, say, because you talked about how you cast Greg Ayers and how you cast Adam. How did Greg Cote get involved in this? Greg Cote is... I've known Greg Cote for quite a while. We did some theater together before he got involved in anime. And Greg Cote is just an effervescent delight. Like, he just... I mean, I'm not going to say he is Shogo, because as you say, Shogo is a lot. And Greg has more social sense than that, you know? But uh, Greg is just such a, a, a gregarious and, and effusively effervescent personality that I thought he would be a brilliant fit. And I love what he did with it. And I think um, I liked the idea that Greg was not a longtime veteran. Um, I liked the idea of featuring a newer actor in that role. Meanwhile, Greg had already done a lot of work on Haikyuu, and I'd had him, I'd used him in Bloom Into You as well. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got some stuff under his belt, you know, and, and so he's not like a, he's not new by any stretch of the imagination. But I like that I was able to put someone in the role of the biggest star in the, in the show, uh, someone who was not the biggest star in the, in the lineup. You know what I mean? Sort of the same thing I did. If you guys saw Todd and Never Falls in Love, I yes, wanted to use. Sure. Yeah, I, I, when I heard Mike Kaimoto's audition. <gasps> oh yeah. man. Yeah, we we did some auditions for that show, and when I heard Mike Kaimoto's audition, I was sold. I didn't know him from Adam. Uh, I would. I only later found out that he had basically just started working in anime. And I was like, well, that's exciting. I was really excited by that because I, I love the idea of bringing up new, you know, new talent. I'm, I, I love it. It's, it feeds my soul to do that. And again, not that Greg Cody is new because he's not. He's been around for a little while now. But 
I felt like Shogo would be a really great fit for him and that his natural personality would really shine through in it. And that's kind of what I was going for as best I could in casting was I didn't want anybody, I mean, with some exceptions, of course, doing any really hard, like, character-y voices. I don't like the sound of that kind of anime. So I like to approach it more, you know, more authentically when I can. Sometimes it calls for it. You know, sometimes the show calls for a very elevated and exaggerated vocal approach. But I like to tend toward the naturalistic. And I felt like um, Greg, I mean, again, I'd worked with him in theater, so I knew his capacity as an actor. I'm all right. I don't know his full, I still don't know his full capacity as an actor, but I know that he's an exceptional actor. So I knew that he would find the place to resonate in Shogo. And I, I just, I... I loved it. In fact, for a while in early considerations, I was thinking of actually finding a celebrity uh, to oh, voice that role. Wow. And I abandoned those plans because eventually I thought, no, I, I don't want, you know, I, a Shogo has got to be the biggest star. It can't be whoever's voicing Shogo. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, being an actor in anime, it gives you a chance to do a lot of things that you you wouldn't otherwise do on stage or in film. And, and, you know, generally those of us who are actors tend to be a lot more versatile in a vocal booth than we are in any sort of visual medium. Because I will forever have my physical appearance to deal with in, in film or television. Not that it's horrible or anything. But I'm a, like, a, you know, I'm a, like m maybe five, seven, uh, five, eight, maybe, um, you know, bald, paunchy white man. I'm never going to play Golgo 13 in a movie. You know what I mean? But I can do it in an anime. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Greg Cody is, a, is an extremely versatile and flexible actor. And... I think doing a voice like Shogo gets to sort of showcase that. And I liked the idea of bringing him up into that role and not, and not going after a celebrity after all. Which, you know, of course brings all its own headaches. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can only I don't, imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. Because yeah. then all of a sudden um, the show becomes about that actor and not the show in general. It kind of loses its meaning yeah, in a way. Yeah, yeah. And I, didn't, I did not want that to happen to Love Stage. I, did, I didn't want the merit of the piece itself to be eclipsed right. by attaching some name to it just because and you know who knows who knows it's it i i've known actors who are brilliant on stage but don't really make it happen in a vocal booth and you know you can go hire yourself a celebrity but it may not work yep you know it may not work in the role and then what do you do likewise i've known actors who were amazing in the booth but have never been on stage you know what i mean or <laughs> never done a film or anything so it's you know it's a it's a different set of muscles, and it, it's a special kind of actor who's really uh, proficient with them. And you never know what you're going to get. Let's uh, let's keep talking about actors because I, I have I have more questions. I have. They are fascinating I, people. It's true. I have I have trash questions. Oh God! Yay. Oh can, no! Can Here we, we go. Can we switch shows and talk about Hitori Jume, my hero, just for oh, a little bit? Oh man! We Here can we so do that. Because I love that show. I I mean, Dave Matranga saying yeah. some the trash line. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know if I should repeat it. Go and, ahead. Uh, Gigi, just embrace it. <laughs> embrace yourself, Embrace Gigi. your inner coach. Let's go, Gigi. You Let's can do it. it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. That's the look I mean when you're begging for me to fuck you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And then when Damon Mills' character says "cut ties with me," or, I swear he said "fuck me," but Stephanie no, 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 says, it's, sleep I, with I me. found it. It's "cut ties with me" or "sleep with me." Which do Which you do choose? You choose? That's, your, um, that's a Freudian here. Oh, yeah. it is. A, you heard what you wanted to hear. Indeed. So, uh, which is actually, of course, what he was saying. So, <laughs> so do we? Literally, when Dave Matranga said that, or Kosuke, sorry, in Hitori Jime, my hero, I think I literally fell off the couch. Screaming. Sorry. I think I just no, it was, it was good. <laughs> but, I, I mean, did not want to hurt you, GT. <laughs> Neither did David. No, no. It's good. No, he I didn't want to hurt you. When I, when, when I watched the show, too, a few weeks ago, and I got to that, I had to stop, and I immediately texted Gigi. I'm like, what is this? What did I just hear? Oh, my God. 
It's time. <laughs> After I wrote it, I had to go to church. No. <laughs> oh, Lord. Lordy, Lordy. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what was the reaction to that, directing him in the booth to say something like that? Well, here's the thing about David Matranga. He is a consummate professional. And, like, you can't even, like, it's hard to get David to crack at all. You know, he's wow. friggin' focused. Like, he's an amazing actor. A studied and accomplished and experienced actor in a variety of mediums. Like, he's pretty, he's, Matrang is the real deal. And so, he wasn't taken aback by it. I mean, he saw the line. He saw it coming. And he, <laughs> like, he, he sort of gave me a look. He's like, really? Whoa. And, but I think generally, in particularly in anime, because, like, you know, you don't, you don't get a lot of fucks in anime. You know no, what I mean? Like, you don't. Doesn't happen a lot. Um, but uh, this one was a powerful one. This show got two of them. Uh, and I wanted them both to be very powerful. And I, I went and I got permission for that. I went to my director of production, Joey, and I said, listen, there's a screw in the translation. He's in the, trans in the direct translation, which, of course, is nothing like the lines you end up hearing. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> in the direct translation, the sentiment was screw. There was a translation note. I mean, that's what the translator wrote. But I think the translator right. just backed off because there was also a trans note that said the vulgar iteration of the word screw is intended. Oh. I took that to mean that screw wasn't quite as vulgar as she intended so that translation to be. So just go straight all out with it. Yeah. And I'll tell you yep. the other thing, which is that line was said to me word for word when I was like 17. So, <gasps> yeah, oh. almost word for word. I had to change it oh. a little bit for flaps, but oh, honey, you know, hey, life is yeah. crazy. Life was life was nutty back then. It was still the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the eighties, yeah. boys and girls. Yeah, like uh, so that line had resonance with me, and as shocking and alarming as it was to me, um, when I was seventeen, Masahiro's age, you know. Right. Uh, said by an older man, right? Uh, oh. um, it was like a, it was a shock. I mean, it, it, for for someone to express something like that to you, say something to you so brazenly and so clearly, and really make no mistake, the the important part of the line isn't the fuck. It's the it's the fact that Kosuke is looking this kid right in the face, and you're skipping like eight episodes of agony. By yep. him going, you want me, I can see you want me, yep. I'm putting a stop to this right now. Like, that's like skipping to the end. And it's it's uh, an alarming experience when you are Masahiro and you haven't acknowledged the fact that you're gay yet. And, like, someone says that to you, someone you admire, someone you look up to, just to wake you up. You know, it's uh, it was incredibly manipulative of, Ko of Kosuke, of course. He was doing his best. He wasn't very smart. Um, likewise, the guy who said that to me, but, uh, it was such an alarming turn of phrase, you know, that I had to re-employ it. I, I, I wanted that, I wanted the shock of that moment to land on a straight viewer in something like the way it might land on a gay viewer who's been through an experience like that. Um, yeah. let me tell you, I, I've everyone who I've talked with who's watched that show was like, did you see that? He's like, did it feel like you got punched in the gut too? I'm like, yeah. 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 Excellent. A fuck of legend. A legendary <laughs> fuck. There it is. It will go down in history. <laughs> we almost got one and then it cut. Oh, yes. God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We had some fun with that one too. I went through so many versions of what that was going to be. <laughs> Oh, yes. So many oh. versions. But and I how, liked how that ended. That was good. Um, how was bringing down Alejandro and Damon from Dallas to come do this? Oh, those guys are like two of my favorite living humans. They are just so delightful and fucking adorable. Like these right? God, these yes. guys, right? Like cinnamon they bowl. kill me. They kill me. They kill me. They're <laughs> oh so God. fabulous. And they're like genuinely kind, warm, well-intended boys, both of them. They're just delightful. And you know what we did? I don't this I guess this isn't general knowledge, really. 
Um, we did not do this with Love Stage nor with Bloom Into You, but I felt with Hita Rijime, the, you know, if Love Stage is the rom-com, if Love Stage is the fairy tale, the abstraction, and Hita Rijime is the drama, it's the story of the street. You know what I mean? There's very little fancy in Hita Rijime. And so, and particularly there are moments, you know, conversations between characters, uh, you know, uh, uh, Asia and Kensuke under the bridge. Uh, oh, as you mentioned, um, uh, Asia and Kensuke in the woods, you know, right before they finally both figure it out. Um, uh, one of my favorite, probably my favorite scene in the entire show is Kosuke and Masahiro uh, uh, on the mountain. And, and they have the conversation about, once again, Masahiro's like, you know, what are they going to do? What are you going to do if they find out about us? Yes. You know, they have that whole yep. argument. Um, and then, of course, a couple of the really connective moments between Masahiro and Kosuke. For all those really heightened scenes, what we did when we recorded them, actually quite a departure from the way anime is usually done. Usually when we record anime, we go in one actor at a time. It's one actor in that booth uh, going through an entire session and doing all of their lines. Um, alone. You're alone in there with the director and the engineer. Um, and often you have other actors in your headphones that you're reacting to. Sometimes you don't, you know, but we do it one at a time generally. So what we decided to do with Hita Rijime was I blocked out a couple of scenes, those scenes in particular, and I think a couple more, um, any paired scene between, uh, the two, you know, between Asi and Kensuke or Masahiro and Kosuke. And we recorded those scenes with the actors together in the booth. Oh. So what you're hearing is those actors vibing off of one another in a way that we don't usually get to do in anime, which is, I think, why you get sort of a more authentic approach to some of that dialogue. And you get, you know, you get quirks and flaws, you get voice breaks, you get actors responding and it really all it takes is the other actor standing next to you you're they're not like acting out the scene they're just talking into the mic but they're right next to each other and when you're as an actor standing next to another actor who you're in a scene with like their physical being is going to change what you do if you're a sensitive actor and all of these four guys are um uh, so we recorded a lot of those scenes together and I think got some really extraordinary results from it. I felt like the drama and the authenticity and all those bits of conversation that we did that way reaches, it's like turning it up to 11, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and uh, what was interesting about that was that David and David Matrenga and Austin Tyndall, who is our Masahiro, are both seasoned theatrical professionals. Like they're vastly experienced and trained. And so putting them together in a room is really like them being in a rehearsal for a play or in a performance for a play. You know, they're they're used to functioning together. And they're the what they achieved when we put them together in the booth was really sort of this, this, it, it, it was the, I mean, the craft of acting was so advanced at that point in their execution that like those scenes just sang. And that's because those guys have a wealth of experience in acting with actual other actors in proximity to them. That's experience and combined with great talent in both of those cases with uh, Damon and Alejandro. Now, both of them, neither of them are come from professional theater experience. Um, I think both of them may have done like some school plays or whatever. Acting certainly, acting with other actors certainly wasn't new to them. But the width and breadth of their experience was in a vocal booth. So for them to be standing and they're like old buddies, you yeah, know, just yep. just friends, you know, nothing, nothing else. They they're just like they're 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 really tight friends, you know. So as opposed to Austin and David, who achieved this like sonorous level such a sonorous level of acting together that they were like <laughs> the the whole room resonated like i'm i'm dying to put those guys together in a play someday but uh uh it would be astounding but in damon and alejandro's case it wasn't the comfort of acting with another actor that served their performances when we pair recorded them it was their awkwardness you know it was their it was their 
unfamiliarity with that nature of recording. And both of those actors are game, you know, so like both of them are willing to go with you on any creative flight of fancy, you know, actors tend to be very affable and very flexible when it comes to, hey, let's try something crazy, you know, but because they're not used to that style of acting and because they're really tight friends and they're in there making kissy noises and like telling each other they love them and they want them. Like they're very oh, professional and at no point on that wall. Yeah. 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 It was pretty brilliant. And then it was just me, baby. I'm the only man in history to have seen that take place. It was oh fucking God. amazing. But like, uh, you know, that sort of awkwardness that they have. And I was going to say, it's, I mean, they're both professionals, right? They're, neither of them were like, oh my God, it's crazy, I can't go out. Like, none of them ever decompressed. But you could tell that being that close to one another was serving that performance. Doing it together in a room, which neither of them had ever done before, was serving that performance. And mm -hmm. because of their unfamiliarity with it, it made both of those characters in those scenes seem less sure on their ground. You know what I mean? Which Kensuke needed because he was always Absolutely, unsure yeah. on his ground. But which Asiya also needed because otherwise he's just a cold fuck, right? He's yep. just an asshole. But yeah. if you hear those little Damon gives us in those scenes, then it humanizes Asiya a little bit. And again, metaphor. You know, Asiya's assertions are really, it's a metaphor for a kid who's come to terms has been through the journey. Like, Asiya has had his co gay coming of age. It was it happened before we meet him in this show. He knew who he was. He knew what he wanted. He knew how to go after it, you know? He was young. He was, uh, like, what, 16, 17? So he wasn't good at it, you know? He made a lot of really bad decisions, as did everybody in that show at some point or another. But, uh, but Asiya needed to have a few cracks in that veneer. So that that slick, uh, self-aware, uh, sort of archetypal male uh, served a different function and would make Kensuke realize what was under that and fall in love with it. Which he did when he was like eight or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you he know. just didn't know it at the time. Yeah, he knew what was there. Bride. And maybe it's that younger, that tender Asya we see in the flashbacks, voiced, by the way, by Monica Rial. Um, who, you know, that's the one Kensuke remembered, and that's the one he knew was under all the, you know, uh, 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 get away from me or sleep with me version of the kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he knew what was there. And those little cracks and those heightened scenes reminded him of it. At the I end see. of the day, Ossie is not that good with words. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> and his intentions. Yeah, no, no. He can be a little catty, that Ossie does. <laughs> well, but again, that. <laughs> that's a that's a thing. I think we. I, th I mean, I think that's a that's a common phase in the gay coming of age for the males. You know, we we tend to get to a point once we've realized that we're gay and we're sort of getting comfortable in our skin, where we'll sort of embrace the queen for a while. You know, we'll embrace the the cold, you know, wise ass, sharp tongued, you know, raging queen. I, I, I love it. it is. I do it when I'm upset. Yeah. <laughs> I got you, I got you. It can be a very effective means of communication. So I think that's a bit of Asya sort of going through that phase too. Sort of like it reminds me of the kid from Big Mouth. I can't remember the, the gay kid's name, but he's just like, he's so sharp. He's as sharp as a knife. And it's beautiful. Oh <laughs> well, coming from that and, you know, the the direction of Damon Alejandro, uh, Jesus Christ, Damon yeah. and Austin. Let's let's move on to the ladies. So, how is it different directing the ladies from Bloom into You? Um, you know, I had all kinds of of speeches prepared, um, not only for uh, Lucy and Tia in Bloom into You, but also for the boys in all the other shows. Like, I had all kinds of speeches about. If they, if they were having any trouble with it or had any questions about it, like how it might have felt for them to be young and gay and only becoming aware of it in all these cases. 
But in all of these cases, I never had to give those speeches. These are some of the best actors I've ever known. Awesome. And they, listen, we all understand ostracization on some level or another. We were all bullied on the playground on some level or another. We, and, and as actors, if we're actors of skill, then we can tap into that and we can remember that and we can bring it back up, you know, hopefully only to put it back down again when the scene is over. That's the real trick. The <laughs> trick isn't acting. The trick is in stopping acting. <laughs> nice. Really. I, oh. But all of these, in all of these cases, uh, I mean, th these actors just, I just sort of let them sing their tune and I gave them a little guidance here and there. Um, uh, when they needed it. That's kind of my job as a director. I'm a goalie, you know, I'm just keeping the ball in play. But, uh, man, Lucy and Tia, uh, uh, you know, I think both of them, even as much as we've heard from both of those actors, I think the anime fandom still really has no idea what either of those actors are capable of. They're, they're, they're extraordinary, both of them. And being in there for those recording sessions is just like, it's like watching, uh, like watching Rembrandt paint. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's extraordinary. Um, I know for me, uh, Bloom into You was a show that really tapped into not only uh, the love between girls, but it had one of the more underrepresented underrepresented members of the LGBT plus community. Uh, yeah, people who are ace. Um, yeah, and somebody who herself. Uh, thought they were for a long time that meant a lot to me as somebody who viewed the show and that was something that a lot of ace fans uh, yeah. really latched on to did you find with bloom into you having a swath of sexualities both for its female cast and its male cast brought a challenge uh for you directing and as well as marissa adapting the script for it you know um that's something marissa has contended with as well Mm -hmm. Um, and it's one of the primary reasons I really wanted her to write that script. Um, I wanted a female perspective and I wanted someone who had been through the, had gone, had traveled the course of understanding, uh, uh, their own sexual identity. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it, it, that was, it was very important to me to have that authentically rendered. And I knew that I couldn't do it. If I had written that script, I have not had the experience of an ace person, nor have I seen the world through a, through a, through feminine eyes, you know? Mm -hmm. So I definitely wanted uh, Marissa's voice in there. And of course, you know, my job as director, uh, uh, particularly of, of these shows is sort of steer that along and, you know, occasions where I, you know, there were snatches of dialogue that I felt might, you know, we, we might be able to better render, better render a, a queer, a queer view. Um, so, you know, we collaborated highly on that project. And, you know, Marissa's understanding of, of that struggle was pretty deep. And I didn't mess with it. It's my little Miki, right? Miki? Yeah. Isn't his name Miki? Yes. Oh, oh, my Miki. He's adorable. I was... I was. I also want to say that I would also like to say thank you for casting one of my particular favorite actors as that. Mine character. too. I love him <laughs> because he's yeah. amazing. Like you I know, freak out whenever him, he like... is in things. Like I'm like, oh, oh my yeah. god, he's back! Yay! Yeah, I got some more Clement Bickham coming at you. There's a thing coming. Yes, soon. God be... bless. Yeah, oh, I know. There's you can be happy with Clint. He's <laughs> versatile, man. You find Clint in a lot of harem shows. You know what I mean? It's kind of his specialty. He's always playing the boy in the harem show. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's but, like, I think like one of my favorite characters that he plays, and I know I think it's one of his too, is a like quiet little Kenma in Haikyuu is one of my yeah, favorite yeah, characters yeah. of yeah, his. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'll tell you something about that Clint Bickham. That boy got <laughs> range. Like, he can do a lot. He can do a lot. I've got him doing something of a villain for me coming Ooh! up. There's a, little, there's a little tease for you. <laughs> yeah. oh, that makes me so yeah. happy. We're, yeah, getting yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting the tea. We're getting the tea. Clint can. Clint's amazing. Clint's an a, a, accomplished actor and, of course, uh, an accomplished writer as well. Like Clint really understands how this stuff is rendered. He's, uh, he does beautiful work and he's a beautiful human. And I love Clint Beckham. Yay! Sorry. <laughs> 
Sorry, I freaked out there a little bit. Um. It's all right. It's all right. I had a moment. Clint was uh, uh, Iki Kurigane in Chivalry of a Failed Knight. You all remember that one? Yeah. Yep. Anybody see that? That was, I think, my second ADR script that I wrote for Chivalry of a Failed Knight. So I wrote the, I adapted the script for that one. And when I found out Clint was playing Iki, I was just like, yes, yes, Chris <laughs> Ames. Yes. My dreams are coming true. Yeah. Oh, God, and of course, it. Lucy is Stella, and she was perfect. Because Lucy's always friggin' perfect. She's perfect. It's amazing. <laughs> Lucy Christian, perfect in everything. Yes. Oh, I love her. Accurate. All right, fam. Do we want to talk about anything else? Do we want to talk about more serious stuff? I have more questions, but we could also just keep eating our marshmallows and we can just talk That's about fun. some fun stuff and finish off this box of wine what 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 are your your druthers my friend do we want to like start a lightning round before it rains outside or <laughs> lightning round a lightning what are you doing round. to me um <laughs> well you know how i'm the only one who's watched 50 shades of gray <laughs> right oh, <God. laughs> no i'm just kidding no um, <laughs> please put me back in the cage a dramatic oh, reenactment. No. Here we go again. It's not, it's not amnesia time. It's not amnesia time. Uh, no. But amnesia. Please stop time. reminding me of that show. <laughs> Don't worry. You can have amnesia and never think about amnesia ever again. Thank God. <laughs> Especially Love Stage's am amnesia plotline in the manga, which makes me want to die inside. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, have a, I have a question for you then. Um, Obviously, there are. You said that you've you've gone through uh, some manga and stuff. Are there any particular manga that don't have anime adaptations that you would like to see get an anime adaptation? That blue sky feeling. Um, my husband's, my brother's husband. Yes, my brother. I've heard such um, good things about my brother's husband. Yeah, yeah. I've got some other things on my shelf. I bought. It was actually when I was in KomoriCon in Portland. I went to Powell's City of Books. It's the biggest building full of books you've ever seen. It's bigger than like the Library of Congress. It's huge. <laughs> and I went straight for the Yaoi section. Um, and I grabbed a bunch of titles that like I didn't know or uh, had heard a little of or nothing of. But I just grabbed them. Stuff that looked wholesome, stuff that looked happy, and also stuff that looked terrassy. But... Uh, <laughs> Among those purchases, there's still a few I haven't looked at, but uh, I read that Blue Sky Feeling, only Volume 1. Volume 2 just came out, like, a couple of weeks ago, and I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But that story is breathtaking, and it's actually about, there is a, they use the word gay in it. That's a thing in Yaoi. Like, oh, yeah. I know this is a revolution. Ooh. Like, this, this one kid, it's about two high school boys, and one of them from the beginning of the show, knows he's gay. Other students know he's gay. They talk about it. Some bully him about it. Like, it deals with gay bullying, which I've never seen in an anime, really. Um, and then this sort of, this relationship begins to develop between him and this other boy, and it's just so lovely. It's so lovely, and such a thoughtful view. You know, a more thoughtful view than the ones I've seen or read. Uh, you know, it deals a lot more with how these boys become friends rather than how they become lovers, you know. And meanwhile, this one kid is definitely ostracized for being the gay kid at his school, which, you know, let me tell you, something all the gay people can relate to. <laughs> yeah. I sure did. Oh, my God. But the story is just fantastic. If I can also recommend, uh, I hear the sunspots is I've been told very good and like a lot very good like drama wise and uh, I, I think also has a character with a disability who is gay. Oh wow! Um, and then a very wholesome, cute, and adorable one is called Go for It Nakamura, and it is very bright and colorful and cheerful. <laughs> okay, I'm writing both of these down. <laughs> Yay! There we go. <laughs> Nakamura. What was the first one? Uh, I hear the sunspots. I hear the suns. I love it. I love these titles. 
Done. On the list. <laughs> Ordered. Delivered. Read. They were great. It's like, done. Oh, okay, easy. Really great. Stop ordering from Amazon. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you can't tell him what to do. I know. Um, so speaking of writing things down on your list, are there any anime that have been dubbed or have not been dubbed yet that you're looking to get your hands on? Yes. Oh. I can't tell you what they are, though. But no! Yes. Oh, it's one of the Uda No Prince Sama. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course she joined us. It's a episode <laughs> I must bring up Uda No Prince Sama. Run while you can. She'll drag you down like she did the rest of us. Yep. <laughs> it's her fault we're in this hellhole now. No. It's a, it's a fantastic hellhole, though. It's not even fun. I he hope just one of those shows noted. that you want, you can free from uh, Amazon's jail. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh it's hard. It's, hard. it's, it's a rough Yeah, there are a few. There are a few I'm looking at. Some older archival titles and also some newer stuff. Um, there's stuff on the way I'd like to get my hands on. But you know, that's that ain't my battle. I'm not the licensing guy. That's a whole I... other thing. So I've, uh, you know, I've let my people know what I think the good stuff is and, and, uh, Hopefully they'll be able to work it out. Again, not my not my fight, but yeah, I got there are a lot of titles I would just die to get my hands on. Worry, and more coming every put, year. We're trying to put the good word in. We try. Come on, on girl. Yeah. Look that gay Ikuhara cop show. Sing it loud. <laughs> oh, from good, the highest yeah. mountaintops. The gay <laughs> cop show. Oh, sorry, Zomni. Oh, yeah. It's um. Do you know the uh, Sentai license it uh, licensed it? Uh, Penguin Drum. It's the guy who created that show's newest show that's coming out Thursday. Starting Thursday. Starting Thursday. Wow. Okay. And I, I don't know much about it other than it deals with coppas and otters. And here's the thing. That man's only made one show that was straight. And that hmm. was Penguin Drum. So we're probably dealing with a gay otter. Potentially. I don't know. a gay otter involved? I hope so because I don't know what's coppa. going on. Can you imagine I always the felt like Hoppa were pretty gay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find out Thursday. We will, we will <laughs> find, find out, out and report back with screenshots. Excellent. <laughs> there Gigi go. will report back with screenshots because she's good. She's I good. expect a full debriefing. Right before I get on an airplane. Yes. Okay. <laughs> done. <laughs> done and done. Um, let's ask more random questions. while we Random have questions. Random questions. Stephanie. Do you have a random question? You're putting me on the spot. And I don't like it anymore. I God. can ask more while you think. That's not I a question. I can't think of any. <laughs> I know it's not. <laughs> but what are you talking about? That's absolutely a question. No, I, 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 uh, I have to think about it. <laughs> Who's your favorite vampire from Diabolic Lovers other oh, than Reiji? <laughs> and who would you date? Not who have you dated, but who would you date? Get out of my way. It's 100% Lita. Bury me. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that dirty little dog in that fedora <laughs> with the voice of Blake Shepard. Yes, oh, just get out of my way. <laughs> we're going to run and we're going to fight. Mm -hmm. You you mm -hmm. realize that now there's a fight that's going to happen over Lighttown. It's not going to end well. Thunderdome. I'm going <laughs> Thunderdome. I will go stuff. into the Thunderdome for Lighttown. Me oh, and Steph are off on the side with Subaru and uh, the one in the bathtub was mine. <laughs> Shoe. Yeah. <laughs> Shoe. Shoe. That was me. That yeah. was mine. Mine yeah. was mine super. <laughs> but then you gotta have like, you know, in the in the other family, you got yes. you got mine Rookie. Was the one that was Bryson. Rookie, Rookie is my good vanilla boy. Oh. Rookie vanilla is pop. here's the thing that got me about Rookie. Okay. He spends the entire season reading Catcher in the Rye. He's reading Catcher in the Rye. That's is the book really? he's reading. Yeah, that is the book he's reading. <laughs> and like that kills me. And that, of course, Rookie in Diabolic Lovers. I wrote the second season of Diabolic Lovers, uh, More Blood. That was my first ADR script ever. God bless. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Yes, I delighted in it. It was so much fun. But, of course, Adam Gibbs played Rookie in Diabolic Lovers. And Adam's, Adam Gibbs' Rookie is what, resonating, what was resonating in my head the first time I heard Rioma speak. <gasps> so... There's a direct line to be drawn from Adam Gibbs' rookie okay. to Adam Gibbs' Gibbs's Rioma. Certainly. There it is. 
Oh my god. I can see that being a thing! <laughs> I can't think of Rookie the same way ever again. Yeah. <laughs> He's <laughs> even sexier now, right? Uh, yes, because I don't yeah. like Rookie. <laughs> Score! <laughs> I god love Steph. It. Steph's like, I win this battle. <laughs> I, always, I was always kind of into the sullen, quiet, dark boys who hung out on the corner and read Catcher in the Rye and shit like that. You know, <laughs> that's like also, That's also me, in a nutshell I'm right there. Kind of a, I'm, uh, I'm kind of a... Uh, it's a weakness. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> she is in disbelief right now. <laughs> I, can't. I can't. Somebody yeah. else go. <laughs> I guess I'll go while they're dying in the corner. Um, I'll ask always two questions. Does anyone this... need an ambulance? <laughs> ambulance for anyone? No, we're going to need one shortly here. This keeps going. <laughs> so, um... When you go to conventions, like, regardless of, like, when people come up and, like, say, like, because a lot of actors have these stories of, like, wow, you voiced X character, like, that really meant a lot to me. Like, is it always, like, this eternal rush that happens? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's surprising. You know, sometimes um, kids will come and talk to me about, about, okay, not just kids, but adults, will come talk to me about shows that, like, I didn't think anybody ever saw, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they'll, they'll, it's, 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 it, it can be very surprising. The ones that people come up to you and connect with. I mean, the kid cosplaying as Alba from Dramatical yeah. Murder was a surprise to me, you know? And the, I, and, uh, talking to him a bit about it made me really understand why he was connected to it. So I never, I never question which, what, what role it may be that a, that a fan is connected with. I'm, I, I'm delighted. I, I mean, I whether I'm an actor or a musician, uh, you know, I spent some years as a musician or a script writer or a director, whatever I'm doing, what I am at my core is a teller of stories. You know, I'm a storyteller. And I I like to participate in that act on whatever level I can get in on. And it's always a delight for me to hear someone who was affected by, touched by, any story I had any part in telling. It's always extremely rewarding. Particularly if it was a if it was like a good touch, not a bad touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean you did like, like right now. go sick. I can't. Was it like that one guy you played in that one show, that was horrible. <laughs> that was the worst thing I've ever heard. Oh God. I understand how you got your first job, but how did you get your second one? You know? <laughs> oh God. Oh, no one's come at me with that one yet. Just okay. me. Uh, good. Good. No, that's good. But like, uh, uh, but yeah, it's always surprising to hear what, what fans connect with. And, and it's always a delight. It's always, it is always a bit of a rush. How, how do you feel about playing a bunch of dilfs? <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. And which one is the hottest? Yes. Which is the hottest dilf? Oh my. Oh. I know where my, I know where my allegiance lies. I'm going to say hottest DILF, I mean, just by sheer mathematics, I'm going to say it's King Victor from Royal Tudor. Oh, yes. good choice. <laughs> He's awful sexy. He's like Brad Pitt, Legends of the Fall, as a dad. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I think that's where the DILF whisper originated. That's where the DILF whisper originated <laughs> from. Yeah, it is. That is. Uh, so I need good that choice. on the nameplate. <laughs> Only because I was thinking of Garo. That's why. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh God. my God. Herman How Luis. could I? I, I had a month on Luis. I had so much fun on that show. Like, working with Caitlin was fabulous. And I have Caitlin my Glass set directed the show. staring me in the eyes. And I have, I have Rico and I have Justin. And I'm like, I'm missing the dead. No, you know what? You've proven me wrong. I'm 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 supplanting Victor. I think you're yes. right. I think <laughs> I think Herman is definitely the guy because he's also Brad Pitt, Legends of the Fall. What's the thing with the flowing blonde hair? I, you know, <laughs> if only I had a little of that in life. You know, geez. <laughs> but yeah, Herman is a he's uh, he's, a trip. he's great. He's great. He's a little horn dog. Oh, absolutely. Oh my god. But he's doing it for the Makai Knights. That's why. Like I need an air. It's all right. Sure, no money. I need oh an air. It's all right. My gosh. Yeah, I can't. Big with the dill. So, um, 
while I have you here, I apologize profusely for coming up and using so many nicknames for you on Uh-oh. this podcast. Oh, no, here we go. <laughs> I, know I mean, my favorite is the fun police. Fun. Yes. Because <laughs> yes. it comes with a siren. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have fun police is from Dive Ball Clovers. The Dilf Whisperer yeah. comes from the Royal Tutor. Captain Hardpants <laughs> comes from Code Realize. And the Rainbow Overlord comes from You Being You. <laughs> Out of all of those nicknames, which one is your favorite? And what can we put on a plaque to give you the next time oh, we see you at a convention? I oh my could God. never possibly pick a favorite. Can't we just <laughs> acronym all of them? Or like make make them like. Can we just get Hardy to make him one with all of them on there? Because we could. David yeah, Wolf. Damn well try. MD, uh, CPA, <laughs> DILF. Uh, Highlander. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Captain David Wald. Captain David Wald. <laughs> like, it's dangerous. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> My friends just call me Cash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, dear sir, is there anything else you would like to talk about before we put out the campfire on this lovely, lovely night? Because... My box is empty of wine. Oh, no. Not the box of wine. We're out of, we're out of marshmallows, too, by the way. Oh. Uh, gotta get I more knew I should have bought that jumbo bag. This party's dying, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can go make it run. <laughs> no, I think uh, you guys have covered a lot of ground here. I think, uh, um, you know. We've said what we need to say about this. There's always more to say, but, you know, we can't just go for eight hours. So. <laughs> I, mean, I wish you could do that. Well, <laughs> I, I know you're a very busy man. I don't want to keep you for eight hours. I can. Uh, I'm an insomniac. <laughs> <laughs> Look here. I have to work in the morning. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, okay. Same. Bam, Whatever. Same. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the three of us and on behalf of all of Dub Talk for coming on to talk about all this with us. Um, Love Stage really is an anime that you'll hear it when we do the episode if you want to listen to it. But it resonates with me in a lot of ways, even though I'm sadly not a part of your Rainbow Tribe. But it it makes me happy on the inside because of Izumi's self-discovery and like I, it comes around in my life when I feel that I need it the most so it came around in 2014 when I need it and it's coming around now when I need it so I just want to thank you for championing championing that for everyone and if it helps people that's all that matters in the long run and you've touched lives you've touched my life you've touched all of our lives here so that's my sappy moment. I just wanted to say thank you for that. Gigi, thank you so much. That's amazing. And I, I you know, and I'll tell you, I'm gonna blow your mind. Are you ready for a mind blow? Yes, mm-hmm. I'm okay. so ready. Let's go. Straight is a color on the rainbow. Really? Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gigi, oh, yeah. we can belong now. It's great. Yeah. I can't even give you honorary membership because that's like full membership. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Just, we are a tribe. Yay! We are a tribe. Yes. I'll make us matching headbands. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> to go along with that black. Oh, yeah. Geez. Straight's like the ultraviolet on the rainbow. You know, it's the one you can't see so easily with all the other, you know, because all the other colors are such... <laughs> snappy dressers really are they? i know i just blend into the background yeah. and then i and then i start screaming a lot and they're like who's that girl she needs to shut up kind of sitting as a wallflower it's all right no one will notice it's fine good, good. Fine. i can only see her with these special glasses <laughs> oh there she is wait oh. ultraviolet burning my eyes That's my, my brand tells you that all the time you my got brand. off on this whole science thing now <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming to hang out with us. Um, if you guys want to hang out with David Waltz more, you can follow him on Twitter at David Wald underscore VA. Oh, right? the places will go. Is there anything that you would like to pimp? Um, <laughs> I Oh, yes, I can totally tell you that uh, I've finished directing a show called Kukoku. 
Uh, and I've heard of it's this, I'm excited. pretty badass little like uh, ironically horror suspense title. Um, it's pretty extraordinary. It will feature Amber Lee Connors I love her. and Carl Masterson uh, and uh, Marissa Lenti. Yay! Uh, Clint Bickham, Josh Greeley. Yay! Uh, Kaylin Coates, uh, Scott Gibbs. Uh, some really extraordinary performances in that show. And it's such a badass show. It was like, uh, it's uh, it's only, I think, it's coming out on home video first. And oh, then okay. it's going to hit high dive, I think, a while later. But just yeah, because, okay. you know, every licensing deal is its own monster. And that one requires that home video be first. So uh, yes, it's gonna hit. It's gonna hit hard disc. It will be coming at you, I think, fairly soon. I don't have a release date for it in front of me, but they've announced it, so not long, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's gonna be fun. It's not gay, but <laughs> it's got one hell of an opening song, though. Oh, the song is so great! <laughs> look, look, it's look so here! It, look here! Like horror, psychological that stuff. That's my jam. Yeah, that's I'm my already excited. Too. That's stuff, I'm excited. That's camp. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm you'll dig this one. It's yes. a suspense <laughs> show. It's quiet, you know. Uh, it's got its moments, mm -hmm. but it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it, the show sneaks up on you. It's I good stuff. I'm already on board. I'm All right, on board. we're on we're on the train. Choo choo! You can All now add train right. conductor to your list of things. There it is. Yes, thank God. I needed more letters on the nameplate. I'll get you a whistle. <laughs> Oh god! I'm like, I'm like a doctor's <laughs> wall of credentials. I swear, like the next convention I see you at, you're gonna get like be like, oh, this girl has a giant garbage bag of stuff for me. Yeah. Watch out! <laughs> it's like time to go away. Now it's time to leave. <laughs> Great! Now I gotta pay another check bag fee. Thanks a lot, Gigi. I'll just FedEx it to your Sentai PO box. It's fine. Yeah, Everyone has one, right? Oh god! Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Fill it to the we absolutely side. have that. <laughs> if you want to follow us on Dub Talk, you can here on this YouTube channel, or you can follow us at uh, Twitter at Dub Talk Podcast, where we pimp everything. You should that do that. Amazing. You should follow the Dub Talk uh, podcast. You should do that. It's a moral imperative. <gasps> yeah, I love Listen that. To me swear. <laughs> <Listen> <laughs> You can a gremlin. It's okay. I follow them. I don't know where we're going, but I'm following them. It's, it's You're just here for the ride. It's all right. You're trust us. Ride. Hey. Trust us. It's going to be at least fun. Around in circles like a hayride. Yes. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> you can follow me at Anime Palooza on YouTube and Twitter. You can follow Megan at Queen Era 2. And you can follow Stephanie at Lilac Anime Review. Review being spelled R-E-V-U-E. And uh, that's all we have. Finally, we've talked for almost five hours about Love Stage, which is longer than the actual anime. <laughs> so actually, you could probably watch it twice. I have. Next week, we do the Dub Talk Love Stage OVA. Yes, there we yes. go. It'll be Wait. perfect. Perfect. Where everyone loses their memory and uh, uh, releases it's a pop album. Yes, and it just keeps repeating over and over again, like in a time loop <laughs> for another five hours. It's Groundhog Day with the characters from Love State. I, I'd, I'd watch it. the hell out of it. Why aren't we funding this? Japan, listen. Come on, Look, Japan. I have a lot Let's of go. money. Come on. I have ten copies of BL anime, and I have nothing to do with them. <laughs> what do I do with all these? Watch party. Yeah. I know. Everyone can take one home. They'll be like party favors. They'll be like... Perfect. He Tori, she made my hero for everyone. Perfect. The Kono Don Chi series yes. is for everyone. Perfect. I bought five of those. Love Stage comes back out. I'll buy another five. I don't care. Just take my money. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> but that is all we have for you tonight. Again, thank you all for hanging out with us. And uh, yeah, we will yeah. see you. Thank you Gigi, listening. Stephanie, Megan, listeners, you're all divine. Get out. <laughs> Get out of my campsite. <laughs> I'll burn the fire out. Sorry. Well, we're, 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 time to get ourselves banned. All right. Uh, all right. Bye. Love your bye. faces. Thank Cheers. you guys for listening.